Hello listeners and welcome to the Montel Weekly Podcast, bringing you energy matters in an informal setting. I'm Richard Sverson. And I'm Anna Shvetska. Anna is a radio journalist and a podcast specialist. Today we're looking at solar power and the way it is changing energy markets. It's come on massively in the last few years and is now the cheapest form of power generation. It can be built without subsidies. And as such, it's quite a threat to the business models of many traditional utilities for several reasons. Please don't be mysterious. Tell me the reasons, Richard. Well, firstly, demand for power and gas will fall as people install solar panels. And that maybe becomes cheaper than that, what they're rece- receiving from the supplier. So the incentive there to stick to expensive energy companies who many are perceived as as not being the good guys in, in the market, then I think you will find an incentive for people to install their own panels and be in control of their own power. Indeed, they can also sell it to each other. I mean, we're seeing pilot projects in several parts of the world, like in the Netherlands and elsewhere, where peer-to-peer platforms are emerging and use of solar power, they have the excess, they have an excess of, of energy and they will sell it to their neighbor or to someone 100 miles away. So these are at a very early stage. They're quite embryonic, but it's a very exciting prospect and, and a development for the way to integrate solar, solar power into the market. But also there's the, the aspect here that solar obviously generates in the middle of the day. And, and traditionally, these have been the times when gas-fired units have been active. So the demand for these gas-fired plants is falling, and so the profitability of these plants as well. For they're often the backbone, or, or they have been utilized by the utilities in the past. But that's all changing. So, Richard, what are the uh, traditional utilities doing? Well, actually, you know, some are, are responding quite well to this. I mean, excellently. They're, they're creating ancillary services. They're installing these solar panels. Some companies are installing them in combination with batteries and EVs. And I think markets well, like the UK and Germany are certainly at the forefront here. But the potential for other parts and maybe more sunnier parts of Europe is, is quite, quite amazing. Even IKEA has home installation PV kits that you can put on your roof. So... Do it yourself. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) DIY solar, DIY energy. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned some of the markets. What are the biggest markets in the European Union? I've heard a little bit of an excitement in Iberia, in Spain. The solar power market over there is reviving after the abolition of the controversial tax on um, sun. Absolutely. Let's say that yeah. 7% was that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's one reason. And they also were unfortunate and they took some retrospective changes to the regulatory environment. So they cutting the subsidies that they'd granted before the onset of the economic crisis or the financial crisis in around 2010, that they granted much higher solar subsidies and they had cut it. So yes, you're absolutely right. It is a, it is a very growing market. Uh, exciting. At the moment, there's still only around 7 gigawatts installed with Italy about 20 and Germany by far the leading market with uh, close to 50 gigawatts. And, and, you know, Germany is not as... Oh, it's sunny in some parts of the country, but generally Italy, Spain and France show massive potential. And uh, which country do you, do you reckon needs a push? Well, hmm, interesting. Or it's yeah. like underusing the potential that they have. Well, I think France is one country. But I think one of the interviewees that I interviewed recently uh, will come back to that. And they, you know, you can hear it from the expert later in this podcast. And where are the biggest growth areas, not only countries, but like... um... Well, according to Solar Power Europe, which is a a lobby group for, for the solar industry... Germany added nearly 3 gigawatts last year, which is close to 70% rise year on year. So massive growth there. Um, The Netherlands added 1.4 gigs and France 900 megawatts. Italy installed about half a gigawatt last year. And actually, it's interesting. The the plans in the Netherlands, again, a northern European country, uh, are quite surprising. They're very ambitious. Uh, I spoke to uh, one of the members of their solar industry um, recently, and they said... They plan to have 23 gigawatts installed by 2023, up from 4 gigawatts at the end of last year. So that's enormous. That's massive. Growth. That's massive. And you think, ah, oh, where's it all going to go? Are they going to put them on canals? Are they going to, you know... Um... It's a tiny country. Exactly. And where's they... But he assured me they could put it on, on top of, um, you know, canals or waterways, even on the side of airports or roads. So, yeah, you he said it was boats as well. Oh, of course, a lot of canal boats. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
What type of solar is there? Well, I think there are two main elements which we touched on earlier. There's there's the rooftop, so householders or commercial buildings that put solar panels on their on their roofs. And there's also the massive utility scale or the kind of power plants which can range from like 20 megawatts up to uh, hundred, several hundred. So that's very common in sort of desert areas. I think Chile has been a, been a front runner in, in developing those industrial scale or utility scale solar. So those are the main types. But uh, who knows? Um, maybe we'll be all be driving around cars with, uh, with panels on the roofs and then charging our batteries as we go along. And uh, tell me something about the policy environment. What's happening here? Well... Our guest interviewees will will go into the details here, um, and they're they're the experts, really. But I think, you know, a key aspect here is is what's happening in, as you mentioned, the tax on the sun, changing that. Then there's also enabling prosumers. So prosumers are the ones that produce and consume. So enabling them to access the market and be integrated into the market. Um, is now enshrined in the next Renewable Energy Directive. Now, I think that could have far-reaching effects in the market. But interestingly, the UK just recently, at the end of last year, I think it was, decided that the producers or the households that have these panels cannot sell their excess power to the grid. So they Mm. just have to provide the excess power freely to the grid. Now, I think that's in direct contravention of this new legislation because the legislation says that renewable self-consumers individually or through an aggregator are entitled to remuneration. Now, of course, Brexit makes this all very complicated as well. Cloudy. Cloudy, exactly. And uh, very opaque. So, but still, I think the directive will uh, will apply in large parts. But, of course, Parliament could make uh, changes. So, I think that's an area that we will see, you know, could, could, could develop in many different ways going forward. I'm very interested in who you managed to speak to when it comes to our experts on today's podcast. So it's Solar Power Europe, which we mentioned earlier in the pod. They have an annual convention. And I spoke to Sonia Dunlop, who's the policy advisor there. And I also spoke to Lea Charpentier, who's the head of European Regulatory Affairs and Government Relations at First Solar, which is a company that provides PV and solar energy solutions. Female voices today. Absolutely. S- solar Three is of them. very... I'm outnumbered. <laughs> <laughs> it's like very solar. unusual, yeah. very unusual in an energy energy world. So. Well, I'm very happy. Yeah. I'm very happy because this makes the, our podcast and our production here much more diverse. Mm. So good. And I'm not unhappy. Uh, well. no. <laughs> <laughs> With me is Sonia Dunlop, Senior Policy Advisor at Solar Power Europe. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Yeah. Uh, Sonia's going to tell us all about uh, the development of solar in Europe and, and the outlook for it generally uh, in the coming years. Now, um, Sonia, we're at your annual uh, conference. Can you tell us a little bit about the sentiment in the market at the moment uh, in the solar market? Absolutely. For the solar PV market in Europe at the moment, the sentiment is really one of solar is back in business. Mm-hmm. We had two very good pieces of news last year. The first was the removal of the minimum import price, EU import duties on PV modules being imported from China, from Malaysia, from Taiwan. That means that overnight, the cost of PV in Europe dropped by a considerable amount. Mm -hmm. And it means that suddenly that unlocks new markets, new deployment, suddenly just shifts the business case and the economics of PV all over the EU. So that was one piece of good news last year. The other piece of good news is that the EU passed this package of legislation called the Clean Energy Package, Mm. which will make uh, electricity markets uh, more fit, more, more, more... able to accept renewables and more able to accept solar all over the EU Mm. and has mandated that by 2030 the EU has to reach a 32% renewables target. Mm. So that and many other things besides in this clean energy package combined with the MIP means that we are very optimistic and we predict growth in the European PV market going forwards steady growth over the next five years which is 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 fantastic because if we look back over the last five years we've been through a period of 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 stagnation of decline actually Mm. Mm. and now that we are seeing these new ways of driving solar demand we are confident that we're going to see growth in the next couple of years in the European PV market. 
can I, uh, costs are, are very low now, aren't they? I mean, we've heard today at, at your annual conference, which is kind of explains some of the hubbub maybe in the background, listeners. Um, but we've heard that it's actually cheaper than, uh, than all other forms of, of power generation at the moment. Of course, it varies from market to market in Europe. It varies from country to country. And it varies depending on whether you're comparing utility-scale solar with the wholesale market price mm. or roof-mounted solar with the retail market price. But mm. yes, in a lot of countries around Europe, the levelized cost of electricity, of generating electricity from PV, is well below the wholesale market price. Mm. Italy, so it's good, Spain, good business sense. Good business sense. If you can make the financing work, if you can find a long-term off-taker, if you can be sure that someone will take your power mm. at a good price over a long period of time. In the form of a PPA, for example. In the form of a PPA, for example, or in the form of some kind of government support scheme, a tender, whatever it might be. Mm. Excellent. I mean, but where are the growth areas now, sort of geograph- geographically in, in, in Europe? I and mean, where do you see the, the major kind of hotspots, if you like? Growth areas, we just heard from the Netherlands, is a market, a small country, but big PV market, actually. Mm. Last year, they were over one gigawatt in size. There's a lot of potential for both roof-mounted and ground-mounted solar there, a lot of interest. And, and what we're seeing is these new markets are becoming more and more relevant as levelized cost of electricity comes down mm. and the situation around subsidy schemes stabilizes. Mm. But also we're seeing that Spain is garnering a lot of interest as well. Big tenders uh, mm. forecasted there for the next couple of years. The government there is really put, pulling out all the stops to meet its 2020 renewables target. They've had some regular, regular, regulatory issues there in the past, haven't they? So, and they've yeah. had some regulatory issues, which means that um, the sun tax, which was for a long time really impeded deployment of uh, mm. self-consumption systems there, is now has now been removed. So so there's a lot of good news. But it's not just that. In France, we've got some big tenders happening as well, some big government tenders. In France is a little bit behind, isn't it? France is a little bit behind, but we do forecast it to be a good size market in the long term. Mm. France, for a long time, had a slightly strange feed-in tariff system, but France is really back in business as well now, I think. Mm. And... And so we're really excited about all these markets. And Germany, of course, is a stalwart of the mm-hmm. European sure. uh, PV mm-hmm. market. So, you know, Germany, France, Spain, the Netherlands, Italy, also a very promising market for PPAs, potentially, mm-hmm. as long as some issues around credit risks get resolved. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of interesting markets going on. And But what you mentioned both rooftop and commercial utility scale PV yeah. or solar. Where is the bigger growth area or is it happening in, in both or in all three uh, segments? You've got to think of them as totally separate markets, actually. Mm. There mm. are two sides to the PV phenomenon. There is the utility scale, big ground mount solar farms that are, com- that are feeding their power into the grid and competing in the wholesale market against other power stations. And then there's the self-consumption market. Mm. The calculations that power consumers are doing, and the calculation is basically this. Can I produce electricity cheaper myself by putting solar on my roof? Mm. Or is it cheaper to buy it from my retailer at the the retail price? Mm. And if it's cheaper to put it on your roof, that's what a lot of people are doing because Mm. they know they can save money on their electricity bills. Mm. So it's two totally separate markets. So the retailers must be quaking in their boots here a bit. Well, what we would hope is that the big utilities that are going through a period of transformation anyway Mm. would see that their business needs to change. They need to go beyond just selling kilowatt hours and kilowatt hours and kilowatt hours. They need to start offering additional services, getting a stronger relationship with their customers, therefore, Mm. and offering solar as an add-on to mm. the, the services they provide at some the moment. Some do, of course. I mean, some, some do. Some, mm. some do, absolutely. But we want to see more and more of them doing that because they have an advantage in the sense that they already have the relationship with the customers. So mm. if they choose to do this and do this properly, they could really make this work. You touched upon an interesting area here, Sonia, which is consumers 
choosing to put panels on the roof instead of going with a retailer. But what does that mean for the grid, for example, the local networks? If, if they're not part of the local network or they're not paying for the upkeep of the grid, the local network, who does pay? Then the people who can't afford to infor- in, you know, uh, put up solar panels, they're, they're the ones who end up footing the bill. Is, I mean, where, where do you stand here? This is the sort of prosumer argument that maybe they're you know, running away without paying the, paying the bills for the upkeep of the grid. This is an argument we've had many times before. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, what we want is we want all power consumers to have access to the benefits of having their own self-generated, self-consumed solar electricity. Not just the rich, but also the poor. Not just people who live in single family houses or in single occupancy buildings but multi occupancy buildings too mm. and I think one of the really exciting things that has happened in the PV market in Europe over the last couple of years is that we've seen these new business models emerge that allow people who live in flats that allow mm. office buildings that have many different tenants in them that allow shopping centers that have lots of different mm. shops renting and using electricity within them allow those kinds of buildings to also deploy PV on their roofs and then sub-meter that PV to the different tenants within the okay, building. Interesting. So there are models out there dealing with this. Absolutely. Mm. In Germany, in uh, in France, in other countries, digitalization and smart metering mm. is a catalyst for being able to sub-meter and then sub-sell the PV electricity on, on a shared roof to multiple tenants within it. To reach the EU's 2050 target, solar growth need to, needs to expand quite massively. We've heard today at, at this event that this means up to 30 to 40 gigawatts a year. I, I mean, is this achievable? Absolutely, it's achievable. And I think the market and the economics of solar will deploy that almost on its own. Mm. One of the points that was made in the event is we have to make sure that we integrate that into the grid effectively and that we we build a flexible energy system that is able to accept and to absorb such high shares of variable renewable energy. I think there are two things. There is the, the 2030 targets and then there's the 2050 target where we hope the EU will set a target of being carbon neutral, net zero carbon by 2050. One point to make is that in many of the modelling that we've seen done on how to get to net zero carbon by 2050 across the EU, solar does not play as much of a part as we think it should. And we think it's because of this, because a lot of the the statistical models that try and forecast how to get to net zero carbon are not sophisticated enough to take into account distributed small scale generation on on domestic roofs, on commercial industrial roofs and so on and so forth. Mm. These models generally look at big projects and so and so we are trying to commission a new model which does indeed take into account both distributed solar but also new technologies such as, for example, trackers and bifacial modules, so double-sided modules Mm. that have a higher level of energy output. Very interesting. It's certainly a much more complex market than when my mother put solar panels on her roof in 1984. Wow, 1984, Absolutely. that is one of the pioneers <laughs> in the solar PV it sector. It made the water no very, very it. hot. We also spoke to Leia Charpentier, who's head of European Regulatory Affairs and is involved in lobbying at, at the European level for a company, not so much the association. So she tells us more what's happening on the side of the companies and how the market's looking there. I have with me Leia Charpentier, who is Head of Regulatory Affairs at uh, First Solar. Solar. Uh, Leia, welcome. Thank you. Could you tell me a little bit about First Solar? What do you do? Sure. Um, First Solar is a, well, the official terminology is we're an energy systems company. So we manufacture modules, but we're also vertically integrated. So we do solar development in a number of regions. We can be EPCs. We offer O&M services. Mm -hmm. And we're a bit of an exception in the solar industry in the sense that we also offer our own recycling scheme. Mm -hmm. I uh, represent them in, in Brussels with the regulators 
regulators. I follow regulatory developments, making sure that everything, both in terms of energy and environmental policy, takes into account the reality of the solar industry um, as seen globally and not just Europe, in a European level. Can you tell us a little bit about that regulatory environment here sure. in Brussels and how, how receptive are they to, to companies yourself? I think generally they're quite interested in what the, the solar industry has to say. I mean, I think we're, we're entering a phase that's quite interesting. Um, historically, you know, the discussion with renewables was about subsidies and it was about how the government could drive demand. Now we're going to be entering a discussion which is much more about disruption. Mm. So how we're challenging certain incumbents and how they do things, how quickly they might have to actually take certain old installations offline, what that means for the grid, what that means for formerly vertically integrated utilities who don't mm. necessarily have the same appetite for change mm. other organizations do. So I'm actually really looking forward to this next phase of dialogue, mm. um, but it's always you know a little bit tricky when you're forcing people to think differently. Of course. And also... I think the regulator needs to maybe come to realization with the fact that they're going to be less in the driving seat and more about creating mm. um, the right, the environment that is conducive to this new wave of changes. So mm. it'll it'll require a certain subtlety and diplomacy mm. to make sure that happens. But I think you know these are it's an exciting time to be in solar, and mm. I think the, the regulators feel that as well. Mm. Um, you just have to deal with people who've been doing things for a certain amount of years of course, and of their course. willingness to go about it differently. So we're at the um, at the, the Solar Power Europe Summit, the annual summit, so that maybe explains some of the background noise sure. here. Um, but you talked, uh, you, you, you mentioned here the disruption. Are they... The, the, the traditional utilities or the traditional energy companies, they're being hit from both sides here in a way, aren't they? They're being hit from the demand side where people are installing rooftop installations mm -hmm. and also from generally utility scale uh, installations. So can you tell me a little bit about the, you know, what, what that, does that mean for the, the market going forward in terms of the structure uh, and, and the role of disruptors such as yourself? I think most utilities see it as, a, as an opportunity. I mean, they, they've identified that renewables is a growth market and that mm. they can't afford to not be part of it. Mm. Um, you're dealing with relatively big bureaucracies when you're dealing with utilities, though. So sometimes, mm. you know, you will have some people who are convinced who absolutely understand what needs to be done on the mm. renewable front, but they're also responsible for other assets, and mm. they have to play a relatively uncomfortable balancing act at times. Uh, it makes it sometimes a little bit difficult to know where they stand. Mm. Um, and then, you know, some of these utilities have very specific relationships with the authorities, Mm. You know, some of them are partially owned by national uh, entities, so their appetite for change will also be defined by how the mm. regulator itself sees things. Mm. Um, I'd say it, it, you really see the full array of those realities in the mm. discussions you have uh, mm. on a daily basis. I think you know times are changing. There's always you know opportunity and risk in, mm. in any change. Um, when you, but when you mention utility scale, is this something from anything from, say, 100 megawatts to, I even heard discussed, like, one gigawatt? I mean, sure. I mean, is that something that uh, can, be, it, done can be done? And where can it be done? I mean, there's, sure. not, there's not, I mean, it needs enormous amounts of land, doesn't it? So we've had a, an interesting discussion internally with my colleagues. Realistically, the idea of having artificial limits is maybe not the most constructive way of mm. having this discussion about how big utility scale can be. I mean, in a large extent... It's defined by you know, your land availability. If you've got a big site, consider a big project. That's where you're going to get most money for your investment. If you've got a series of smaller sites that you could all build together, well, maybe that's the best way. Mm. And we find it's usually better controlled in the context of, you know, what's your land? What are your permitting requirements? What is, you know, the level of interest from the local communities, how close mm. or not you are to, to people living? Mm. Mm. And then find the best economic outcome within these parameters. So mm. instead of choosing abstractly 20, 30, 100 megawatts, mm. which won't necessarily apply to all the realities, mm. define very clearly in permitting what is allowed mm. for specific circumstances and have that be the guide mm. more than just some abstract notion of mm. you can only participate in the French tender if you're putting together a project on 30 megawatts. Yeah. But what if, you're, what if your land can accommodate 50? Mm. Why put together two projects? Sure, sure, absolutely. So, so it's so very context dependent and, exactly. and dependent on the, on, on and, the and environment. I, and I think in a way, you know, we, we are really dealing with solar being the cheapest energy source, you know, mm. today and increasingly in the future. Where the moments where your cost is your main driver, mm. have a very open discussion about scale and what mm. that may mean. Mm. 
if cost is less of a driver, then maybe you know mm. other parameters come into play. Mm. But I, I think there's a little bit of work and education and open discussions to be had about utility scale. I mean, we mm. are talking about taking offline a lot mm. of aging assets. Mm. You're not going to replace those gigawatts of coal factories or nuclear power plants mm. with rooftop installations. Let's just, you know, mm, mm. be very honest about the fact that that's a myth, mm, mm. and then discuss very openly what is acceptable and what is not, and mm. how big certain projects can get. Um, you know, if you're worried about having a dip in your um, in your energy supply, mm. you might want to just put, you know, a few big installations out there. That's probably the most cost-effective way of doing it. Mm. If you don't have the land to do so, then you'll be looking at another solution. What we just mm. want to raise to do is raise awareness of the fact that that is probably your cheapest, lowest cost solution. Mm -hmm. So be very honest about mm. that when you're looking at the options going forward. So the issue of uh, acceptability, Leia, that you you mentioned when you when you were leading a, the panel discussion very well, <laughs> I may add. Thank uh, you. Is it more acceptable to have to be living next to a solar farm mm -hmm. than to a uh, wind park? Would you say? I I am not that familiar with the with the wind discussion. I think in a, in a way there's been more experience with large scale wind mm -hmm. than there has been with large scale solar in Europe. So mm -hmm. maybe they're you know showing signs of what's to come with mm -hmm. solar. I mean, no matter what, we need to learn from their experience. Mm -hmm. um, so far, I don't think acceptability of solar has been much of an issue mm. but as we're looking wow. at the volumes you know mm. France has an objective of 4.5 uh, gigawatts of solar deployed by year mm. this is really going to change the the proximity people have with the technology mm. and we need to be prepared to have a discussion with people mm. who mm. are going to be living a lot closer to these sites and it's mm. going to be part of their everyday life Maybe there is a difference of acceptability. I just think that overall you owe it to the communities you're moving into to do a certain mm. amount of education with them. Sure. You mentioned the 4.5 gigawatt annually growth mm -hmm. in France. Is, yeah. that, is that achievable? France is having a hard time actually meeting you know, the deployment of one gigawatt. The French market is really interesting to us. Mm -hmm. um, it's been it's been predictable at a time when a lot of European markets were not. Mm -hmm. You knew exactly what were the volumes that were going to be auctioned off. The auction process was relatively straightforward. You knew what would came in, and your time to deploy it and to build the projects actually also made sense for for utility scale. So, we have a pretty good experience with the French tenders. We're really looking forward to the fact that these deployment mm. numbers will happen. Um, mm. I think that's what the authorities are too, and even mm. the French solar industry, um, how fast that will happen or not, I mm. think will depend on a lot of, you know, reducing delays around permitting grid uh, connections. Mm. I mean, what I hear from the French government is that they're genuinely interested in tackling these, mm. how quickly it will be done. I mean, it's all, the proof is always in eating the pudding, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> What are the other challenges going forward, Leia, for the, for the industry uh, as a whole? Pricing and lack of transparency around pricing is always mm. really tricky. Pricing for, 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 for modules. For modules, for modules okay, and sales. okay. So, you know, I mean, with the hundred pound, you know, the thousand pound gorilla, which is the Chinese PV industry, mm. really setting the tone mm. uh, of, of what, you know, pricing and volumes will be available globally, um, managing to be competitive, managing to put enough money aside to plan mm. your expansions and mm. sign long-term contracts. All of these things um, are very complicated in this context. It requires a completely different type of, uh, of industrial DNA. And, mm. and sometimes when I hear people, you know, EU regulators um, talk about the fact that we need an Airbus for solar, just going, you know, this is old school industry, mm. highly capital intense. You could kind of plan what your demand was going to be for 30 years. The solar industry, as we know it today, isn't even 30 years old. The idea that that model can be transposed to what will make solar competitive tomorrow is, is a little naive. Yeah. It's, it's new thinking. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, we're moving away from the past century and these old sort of sure national champions, etc. Exactly. Making you know. sure you've got enough money aside that you can, you can invest in a ramp up at the right time, oh. mm. that you can stay away from a ramp up if the timing isn't right anymore, um, mm. that you have long term customers that will shield you a little bit from mm. that price pressure. But fundamentally, you know, this is really something that decides the actors who are responsible for producing the main component of PV. Mm. 
have a big question mark about you know whether they're going to manage to be around on a certain amount of time mm. and you just have an obligation to stay ahead of the Asian developments which can be a little bit hard to anticipate yep. it well, makes it interesting mm, absolutely <laughs> you know the future is very bright for them yes. yeah, for, for Zola uh, to, to, to coin a bit of a pun there we talked about Zola we talked about the PB, the outlook, and, and certain changes that have been made and to enable the, uh, the market to develop uh, and to help Europe meet its 32% target for 2030. That's going to be interesting looking forward. Absolutely. Hopefully we'll be there in 2030 to look back and see what happened then, Anna. So we're saying goodbye from very sunny London today when we are recording this podcast. Of course, when we will release it, it will probably be cloudy, rainy and awful. For more energy news, go to montelnews.com and follow us on Twitter at Montel News. Thank you for listening and tune in next Friday. Goodbye. Bye.